Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're raring to go. Uh, everybody's present and accounted for. Uh, let's uh, give a greeting to the congregation to start off here. Let's start with uh, ladies first, uh, the untwisted sister, Sister Renee. Hello, everybody. Hi. Oh, there you go. Hey there, beloved saints. Good to see you guys today. It's a beautiful sunny day here. School's about to start up. Uh, so we're enjoying the last little bit of summer here. So I'm happy to be with you guys today. All right, I'm very embarrassed. I did mute that originally, but for some reason it didn't uh, register. I, had, I thought I had it muted. I uh, apologize to everybody. Okay, Brother Daniel. Well, you want to say hi to the congregation? Hey, guys. It's good to be here. Fantastic. He looks like you got almost the whole family there, huh? Uh, they're all uh, around. <laughs> all right. Very good. So, uh, and uh, Brother Ben, how about a greeting? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's good to be uh, with you all today. And... Uh, be together with you guys for the Sunday service. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. Looks like uh, we've got quite a few people in the chat room ready to get started too. So hello to everybody. Do we have moderators? Yeah, we have Brother Hendricks there and Sister Heather. Thank you for being there. We couldn't do this with, without your help. Um, all right, um, I don't have any announcements to make. Did anything come to anybody's mind that needs to be announced to the congregation? Okay, if not, let's let's uh, see what prayer needs uh, uh, that the congregation has. Um, Brother Daniel, let's start with you. I certainly know that we, we should all keep praying for you and your family, but what, what else would you like us to pray for? Yeah, keep praying for me, but I pray for my friend Pam um, here that goes to church with us. Uh, she's also my fourth grade teacher. She's on a kidney transplant list. And also I have a fr another friend of mine that I grew up with. She's actually on a, a transplant list for kidneys as well. And um, her name is Kelly Thorne. So just pray for them. Okay. And I will, I, I think I have to say, tell you this, Brother Daniel, this, this photograph where I'm looking at right now, compared to your face uh, presently, uh, you look younger and healthier to me. Uh, maybe your beard's trimmed and, and stuff, but your, your face looks a little thinner and you look, look very good, actually. You've could be, become quite a handsome man. <laughs> I need to cover it up more. That's, that's my, my own opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think, Renee, don't you think he looks better and good, looking healthy? Yes, he does. And uh, I'm mourning the beard, though. It's a little shorter than we're used to. You were starting to look like some of those Hebrew rooter guys. I was waiting for you to put a part in it. Start getting to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually like the beard, but it, you know, it was to the point where my mustache was interfering with my meals. And so I just got tired of it and just... Eh, Took it down, but it's coming back. Anything in the way of food in my mouth has got to go. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. Uh, well, you you grow a, a very uh, great beard. Uh, you, you grow it very quickly, and it's so full. Uh, but I, I prefer it trimmed closely. It looks it looks real nice and neat right now. So that's my vote to keep that's it like the, it is. That's the Arab in me. I got that beard going. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to hear more about that exactly. If you've done any genealogies, you can give us more details. Uh, just Syrian and Lebanese. My great grandfather was born in Damascus, and uh, my great grandmother was born in Beirut, Lebanon. Wow, fantastic! So you you have some genealogy on your side too, don't you? Yes. Yeah, so are you, are you going to be bragging about your genealogy in the future? No, because in the flesh, I'm of Ishmael, but of, in the spirit, I'm of Isaac. Praise oh, God. Okay. All right. Now that I know you're an Ishmaelite. All right. 
uh, brother, um, brother Ben, uh, would you tell us if there's any prayer needs uh, for you? And also, Ben, if you could look in the chat room and let us know if anybody in the chat room posts a prayer request, let us know what that is, please. Yes, it's not easy for me to do both, uh, but I, I will try. Um, with regards to uh, prayer requests, I would just pray for that the uh, the health and vitality of our church here. Um, uh, it's very precious to me, and I think it's very precious to everyone here. So I would pray that, uh, again, we just have spiritual prosperity. All right, let me let me take a quick look in the chat room and see if it, it um, to everybody in the chat room, uh, if you have a prayer need, would, would you post it now in all caps so that we can recognize that before we, we move on? Hendricks just posted one and MG has one. Okay. Ben, would you like to read them? Can you be able to do that? It's right uh, on MG's. Yeah, I mean, whoever's looking at it, if they can read it, it'd take me a minute to find it. Okay. All right, go ahead, Renee. All right, let, let me read those two. Hold on. And then we'll look back. Ben's juggling a million things right now. Uh, Hendrick says, I'd like to continue to ask for prayer for brothers like Yvonne uh, for his ministry offline. Amen. We miss him very much. Please let him know that. Uh, for Brother Chase, uh, that's our little brother down in Florida. Uh, and prayers of health for my aunt, my friend, and my brother in Christ, John, and also for his father. And MG says, please, everyone, I need a job. Pray for me to find a job. Hopefully a great job, too. And let me see if there's anything else I see up there. Uh, so far, I don't see any, but uh, I do want to mention Jennifer Petty. Now, we've been praying for her for a while, Brother Luke. And you know she has lupus. She's disabled. She lost her mom recently. Now they're worried about cancer. She's been very sick this last year and couldn't find out what's wrong. So they're looking at other autoimmune diseases, but they're really concerned about cancer. She had uh, COVID and recovered from it. Uh, but now something uh, uh, is very wrong and she wants a good report. She's just been through so much and she is a great sister in Christ. So please keep Jennifer Petty, Anthony Suarez for his kidney transplant. And Jonathan Hind over in the UK, his channel is uh, Christ Loves Jonathan or something like that. If you guys see him, reach out to him. He lost his mom and his best friend last year, and he is struggling with cancer. He's feeling very alone. Please reach out uh, to him. Sometimes the best thing we can do is just be there and, and pray for people, you know, but let him know that you're there for him. Uh, and as always, I want to pray for everyone on this panel and all of us who preach the gospel. Matthias, Sister Lisa, uh, Angel, Ben, Daniel, Luke, myself, all of us, uh, Brother Dave, that stand for the truth of the gospel. Because not only do we have a spiritual attack, but we have the hatred of the religious working against us and making ad hominem personal attacks against us as well. So um, always keep us in prayers because we're going to keep fighting. All right, guys. Thank you. All right. Oh, Sister Lisa's leg is not well yet, Brother Luke. We need to keep praying for Sister Lisa's leg. Mm -hmm. I didn't know something was wrong with her leg. I knew she wasn't feeling well, but I didn't know it was her leg. It's edema. It, she keeps getting these swelling, the swelling where you can't walk well. It's so painful where your legs swell up. No, oh, no. I've been having that for a while. Hmm. Okay. Well, there, there's a lot of needs. Uh, we'll pray and give this all over to the Lord. I, I will add a, a praise report uh, just so everybody knows that uh, it's, not all, it's not all gloomy. Uh, the, the, the Lord is listening, and, and the Lord does say yes. Uh, the, the, the prayers for uh, Becca, my, my son's wife, with MS, um, we are... My wife and I spent some time with them yesterday. We went up to the mountains and we had a picnic and it was a great time and uh, got a good report from, from Becca and she's uh, she's just doing great. Uh, pretty much, I'd say 99% of the, the symptoms are completely gone now. So just what we were praying for that this MS will either be completely healed or, or be reduced so that it, it's something that she can live with. So thank you, Jesus, for that. 
All right, anything else before we begin the prayer? Okay, all right, then I'm gonna ask everybody in the congregation now, we'll, we'll take 30 seconds and ask everybody to pray for all these needs now. Amen. Um, and as I heard Sister Lisa say last night with their prayer time, uh, uh, all who agree, say amen now. Okay. Amen. Right. Very yep. good. All right. Uh, uh, Brother uh, Daniel is uh, ready and he's got some music for us. So, Brother, I'll turn the music portion over to you now. Sure. All right. I haven't done this song in a while, so paid in full, one of my favorite ones. See our Savior hung between two thieves. Hear the soldiers mock his name. See his followers as they cry in disbelief this could not be the reason that he came see him realize his life is through feel the love burn from his eyes behold the temple veil it is torn in two. Hear the one on Calvary as he cries. It's paid in full. I've done the work I came to do. Paid in full. I paid love's final price for you. When all hell tries to tell you that. You'll never win. Just remember that the debt for your sin is paid in full. See his children torn between two ways. Some still choose to mock his name. See his followers now, as they can boldly say, We are the reason that he came. My son shooting that got my mind off the next lyric. But see the ones who trust themselves alone To do what only Christ can do Through Jesus' blood alone we may approach the Father's throne Hear the words as he still call to you Spade in full I've done the work I came to do, paid in full. I paid love's final price for you. When all hell tries to tell you that you'll never win, just remember that the debt for your sin is paid in full. I've done the work 
work I came to do paid in full. I paid love's final price for you. When all hell tries to tell you that you'll never win, just remember that the debt for your sin is paid in full. You just remember that the debt for your sin is paid in full. Paid in full. Amen. Fantastic song choice. All right. Let me think of this one here. I haven't done this one in a while either. My brother Luke likes this one, so we'll give it a shot. <clears throat> See if I can do it. <laughs> here we go. When I go, don't cry for me. In my father's arms, I'll be. The wounds this world left on my soul will be you. I'll be whole. Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face. And I will not be ashamed, for my Savior knows my name. It don't matter where you bury me, cause I'll be home and I'll be free. It don't matter where I lay. All my tears be washed away. Amen. Thank you. I love those songs, especially uh, anything that's a little bluesy or bluegrass gospel style. That's my favorite. Of course, we might not have as many others uh, in the congregation that prefers that like I do. Um, okay, I guess we're ready now to get into the discussion part of the program. So let's uh, let me find the questions here. <clears throat> All right, Ben, the first question is, uh, when it comes to trying to win non-believers to Christ, I found that there are lots of stories in the Bible that I really wish were not there. 
One that has been a particular issue for me to explain is Elisha and the two bearers in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. How would you answer someone who wants to know how Christians justify a prophet cursing a bunch of kids to be mauled by two bears? Is God saying it's okay to kill kids for making fun of us? Well, I'm glad I'm not going to go first on this one. Sister Renee, what do you think? I need to read this carefully. Hold on. I found non-believers. Lots of stories. I really wish we had. <laughs> yep, yep. All right. Well, here's the thing. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of the gospel or Christ. There's usually a hidden message there. Also, there's some things that people put there that aren't there. For instance, uh, the one on the bears. It can be easily misunderstood. I did a video on that. People think that uh, Ezekiel sicked a bear to kill a bunch of little kids because they were picking on him for being bald. That is not what happened. They were messengers of Satan trying to keep a prophet from delivering the message of God. In addition, they mocked the ascension of Elijah. They said, go up, bald head, go up because Elijah was taken in a, a, a whirlwind. They call the fiery chariot. And instead of seeing that as an amazing miracle of, of God, they mocked it. So these were not just, these weren't little kids. When it says young men, the word used there are, are like soldiers ages. And th there was more to that story uh, than it seems. Also, there's some things like the guy that offers his daughter says the first thing that comes out of my house, I'll offer to the Lord as a burnt offering and his daughter comes out. Well, you'll notice in that story, God didn't ask for it. And he did that out of his haste and his hesitation, uh, his desperation. All he had to do was just go to God as his father. But instead, he thought he'd make some deal with him. Uh, there, There's no pleasure in that. God doesn't ask for human sacrifice, but it was done. It's in the Bible, but God didn't call for it. So here's the thing. You can tell people that are unbelievers, there will be a lot of things that you can't see until you're saved. And God will reveal those things. There are also things in an ancient tribal society that are just historical records. And, and you can't get wrapped up in that. Things that we won't understand in this day and age. Uh, we don't understand sacrificing children to idols, literally. And the things that were being done in a tribal society. So uh, there are things that are difficult, sure. But until somebody's saved, they're going to want to find things to hate God for. I, I was commenting earlier, everything I see on TV portrays God as a homicidal maniac that kills children and, and just destroys the world with floods. And he's just, you know, they, they have no understanding at all. And so the, the best thing with the Bible is I would tell them, one, it's historical about a tribal community that was chosen to for the Lord to be born through. And you will understand these things better once the Holy Spirit's in you. But go to the gospel and you can tell them the Old Testament makes it a little harder to see God. You don't really know him as personally until Jesus comes so that you can know the real heart of the father. Then you can go back and see the grace all along everywhere. But, you know, the old covenant was God demanding. That's how he was dealing with people. If you want to do it on your own righteousness, it's a curse. But I'm going to save you from that curse. And that's the message of the gospel. So uh, we can't just pick and choose little things and decide that's what God's all about. So I would just tell an unbeliever the good news of the gospel, explain a little bit to them about what Jesus accomplished and why it was necessary for them. 
And then when they get saved, they can start seeking God's word and understanding it. But we're still all learning and growing. There's a lot of things in scripture I wish weren't there. There are. They're difficult. But we got to remember God's ways are not our ways. And one day we will see clearly. It says we see through the glass darkly. But one day we'll have complete understanding. We will no, no more be children, but see the Lord face to face. Amen. Uh, sister, that was an excellent answer for a difficult question. Uh, Brother Daniel. I, uh, I actually look at this kind of a different view in a sense. The way that I see this is, you know, when you look at the passage, it talks about them being little children. And so in my view, according to the scriptures, I believe that children are not accountable. Um, and, and so they're, they're not to the age where they have to believe the gospel. So in, in God allowing them to be killed by this bear, it's actually an act of mercy because with that kind of attitude of mocking the Lord, when they get to the age of accountability, they may not uh, choose him. They may not seek him. So maybe the Lord took them out before they had the opportunity to reject them, you know, when they got older. So um, even the same thing with the flood, you know, I believe that uh, when God destroyed the world, it was actually an act of mercy because left to himself, man would have destroyed himself. And therefore stop the savior from coming but god allowed uh, noah and his family to be saved but he actually destroyed the rest of the world so that way jesus would still come and die for the sins of the world so you know it's a terrible thing but it's also a lesson to people don't make fun of the lord and the lord's man and then you know you know there there's all you always reap what you sow and so god allowed that to happen so a lot of things that we see that happens to people, you know, think about some of the teenagers. I mean, I, we've all heard the stories about some of these car wrecks and stuff and these kids that saying that they didn't want to listen to the Lord and all. Could it be the Lord was just having mercy on them and taking them physically so that way they would not go to hell before the age of accountability? So, I mean, that, those are only things that the Lord knows. But um, that's just kind of the way that I perceive that. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I think uh, both of you, um, you, you trying to uh, make the best out of a, a bad situation and put the best possible spin on something that is, uh, you know, as the, the writer of the question said, this is, this is something that is uh, hard to explain and justify to the non-believer. And um, so sometimes there's not really a good answer. We just do the best we can. But I, I think that uh, if that was the case, uh, Daniel, that, that would be uh, wonderful. I, I hope it is the case. Um, the thing that worries me about that, though, is that uh, I don't see anybody killing their children or but of course, then there's abortions. Uh, so in that case, many people are killing the unborn. But then a person could easily justify it and say, then we ought to kill all the little children. I mean, that way, all everybody gets to go to heaven then because uh, let's just kill them before they uh, reach that age of accountability. Um, it may sound like an absurd position who would do that, but uh, it, it is a logical uh, step um, to take. Uh, Friday night, we got on one of the questions that was uh, we were talking about um, God um, killing people. Uh, the, the guy that uh, I think it was Uza or somebody touched the altar or touched the ark and uh, died. And we're asked to explain that. And I'll repeat something I said there that uh, I believe that, that God is very liberal uh, in, in dishing out the death sentence. Um, and and, and the, in human eyes, we, we, we think that as being, uh, wow, that seems overkill. It's harsh. It's 
Why? Why would you be so readily uh, to, to uh, issue a death sentence for what seems like sometimes, let's say, you didn't, you disrespected your parents or you, you did something in the Levitical law that seemed to be minor, and yet there's a death sentence attached to it. And what makes me okay with that uh, is, is my view that the, the lost perish, because if, if that was the case, that the, the, uh, the, everybody was just being killed for, uh, you know, like the bears or the, uh, there's another case where a prophet was, uh, was he attacked by a bear? Or, uh, there were two prophets. I forgot this that that story exactly, but there were two prophets, and one told him that uh, he got a prophecy that contradicted the original one, and a bear was involved in that one too. But uh, when we read these accounts of um, uh, what seemed like Danny, you said that God uh, God allowed it to happen. Uh, that might be the case. Certainly, he did at least allow it. He could he could have stopped it, and he didn't. But did he allow it or did he actually cause it to happen? We don't really know that. That's something we'd have to, maybe we could figure it out, but I doubt it. Uh, but it seems that God's attitude about uh, issuing a death sentence is um, uh, tells me that God doesn't know anybody's life. Uh, anybody who is born into this life, if you live 10 years or 50 years or 100 years, Whatever t time we get to live, that's a gift from God, life, for however long it is. And if God sees fit to end your life early, uh, then uh, that's his, his prerogative for whatever his reasons are. And if it was the case that they're going to be tortured forever in hell uh, because of it, uh, I would probably uh, have more explaining to do. But since I believe that uh, they just perish and no longer exist, then I think that uh, it it. it sits what better with me because of that all right any more from uh, daniel or, or renee I, I wanted to say a lot of times people were physically killed but they were saved they were israel a lot of the people and he used it as an example to the others uh they they lost their physical life but nowhere people read into scripture all the time they must have went to hell no those that were God's people, they can make terrible mistakes and God can use them for his glory as a vessel of dishonor. But most of the time when you see stuff like this happening, they're disobedient children. A lot of times, like King Saul. We know that the prophet Samuel told him, tomorrow you will be with me. You and your sons will be with me. And we know the prophet Samuel was saved. Many people try to use the Israel not entering into the promised land shows that they didn't enter heaven it was a metaphor well if that's the case moses isn't saved either because he didn't get to go to the promised land at all so we can't be quick to say you know uh uh to, to make these judgments on god and to also say things in the bible that are not there we cannot assume these things you know god's grace is there and there are things difficult in scripture and it's there's it's a time period and a group of people we just cannot really relate to right now but when when the veil comes off and you have the holy spirit he will begin to show you these things and the purpose of them and, and yeah brother luke i did a video on that same uh, uh prophet he was lied to by another prophet of god he had promised not to eat or drink or go the same way he came during that whole time and I believe that was all a shadow. You can own, there's only one bread of life and it's Jesus. So uh, if somebody's interested in that story, they could go to my channel and uh, type that story in also. There's lots of stories that are difficult to understand. Yeah, the only thing I disagree with you about that, Renee, about Hebrews 4 and them entering into the promised land, the Bible literally says that they did not believe the gospel there in Hebrews 4 1 so um, and then he but he used them as not to fall after their example of unbelief to believe the gospel so don't be like them who did not believe the gospel and perished but be like those who enter into his rest yeah where it specifically says they're in unbelief that's a different story but but to say that because they 
didn't get in, if somebody didn't get in, like Moses, he didn't get in the promised land, but he was saved, you yeah. know, unless what I'm saying is not to put things into scripture that aren't there. You know, if it says specifically like Judas, he never believed he was a devil. And people say he lost salvation. That's not what scripture says, you know, unless it specifically says, uh, and they're condemned to hell or they did not believe that that's a whole separate story. And I do think that was an example that is you. I wasn't even thinking about Hebrews, but <clears throat> yeah, Hebrews uses that as an example. Don't do what they did. Believe the message because you're going to suffer uh, more wrath for rejecting so great a salvation. I agree. Uh, with you. Look, you mind if I answer uh, this question? Yeah, go ahead, man. Okay. Well, well, Real quick about the reference to Hebrews. Um, again, I'm convinced if you study it very carefully, uh, Hebrews entering God's rest is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of God entering God's rest on a daily basis through faith. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a clear, there's all kinds of clear parallels uh, to the Old Testament. And one of the most clearest examples, I believe, uh, is again, Hebrews is saved to believers, telling them not to draw back. And uh, becoming dull of hearing. Well, that's it. when it, and basically what happens is it, they said, okay, don't go back to the law it, because they crucified Christ again for themselves all over again. Well, that's a direct parallel to what Moses did where God said, first time, strike the rock. Then the second time, speak to the rock. But he, Moses did not speak to the rock. He actually had to hit the rock again twice because, because Moses had become dull of hearing. He said he wanted to strike the rock again, and that's what these Hebrews were going to do. They didn't want to uh, live walk by faith. They wanted to go back to the law. They're being uh, lured back to the law. Um, it says, you know, the, we who ha have believed, that's past tense, have entered that rest. So that's a positional statement. But then he's trying to say, okay, well, now we need to press on to maturity, and on a daily basis we need to enter God's rest uh, through faith and not to draw back. Uh, and the temporal, it's, uh, the punishment there is, is all temporal. Um, again, I can say much more about that later, but uh, I'll, I'll save it for now. But with regards to this particular passage, um, I, Renee, I thought you might brought up some excellent points. And also, too, I think, you know, the first thing I, I hear when I hear about atheists, you know, saying such statements is what Paul said. He, he says, basically, you know, who are you, old man, that would talk back and stand in judgment of God, who is perfectly righteous always? Um, and so, you know, again, these these children, well, I don't know how old they were. I, I have to study it out. That's it. Uh, Aaron, you brought up a really interesting point. Um, that again, they, you know, if we as Gentiles, we're pretty much born, we were born in darkness, essentially. Um, but Israel, their whole culture was centered around, centered around from cradle to grave about God, essentially. Whether they believed it or not, they had, they were exposed to that like constantly. So, you know, so I'm not making excuses for anyone, but. Um, you know, we, we Gentiles tend to say things and swear by things, and, you know, make promises that we don't even really think about too much. But back in that culture, all those things were, uh, you know, it was not just, a, it was part of your, your conscience would be pricked, I think, seriously, uh, back in that culture. And I believe that the, the Elijah is a type of Christ and, um, you know, Elijah, what, what cause did they hate him? They, they hated him without cause. The spirit of God was on him. I think they knew, uh, essentially that, you know. He wasn't doing anything wrong. And the fact they called him Baldy, too, I, I, this might be a stretch, but I uh, thought that out there. I, I'm just thinking of this as I'm speaking. But, um, you know, I believe Samson's a type of Christ, and his hair was cut off. And when his hair was cut off, he's thrown in the dungeon, uh, you know, basically a hell. Um, and But his hair grew back. And, uh, and, that, and that hair is a kind of picture of life that they did. They, he was cut off, just like Christ was cut off uh, from the living. Uh, Samson's hair was cut off. And I almost see it's almost see like they're mocking and Christ was mocked on the cross and and this uh, prophet who's bald, I, I think you know spiritually in the spiritual world that makes it basically thinking saying yes you're you know you're condemned and, and uh, we're, we're glad that you're condemned uh, you know we're, we're wishing condemnation on you even though there's no cause or anything else just like they did for Christ and also too I wonder if the if the two bears are a picture of the Medes and the Persians from Daniel. Um, and I think that happened subsequent to this, this episode here. Uh, so that may be something to think about too. Where it, because also too, it says, and two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 months, 42 of the use. Well, 42 months is a part, is a, uh, is half of the tribulation period, uh, I believe. And so I think it's, it's a prophetic picture of that judgment um, of Israel, essentially. 
So again, all these things happen for a reason to, so that we can learn from them. It's not like God did this every single time such a thing happened, but this incident was recorded for our, for our own benefit. It would be a wise for unbelievers to heed it. So mm -hmm. Wait, guys, I think all of us on this panel would agree on one thing in this uh, question. One of the things I liked about Robbie Zacharias is he always said, you know, there's a questioner behind the question. And it's usually because they, they have some misunderstanding or they've been hurt or they're angry at God for something. And whenever we see unbelievers hating scripture, hating, they've usually been hurt by someone that claimed to be a Christian or someone that acted in hypocrisy, or they are just hateful of God's ways and they hate God and they don't like that. Uh, they have to think about they might be judged for the things that they do and they don't think that's fair They want to be able to do what they want But one thing I will say is every atheist I've seen that gives this One they haven't really researched scripture. They haven't really investigated it. They just keep mimicking the same arguments against it and they claim they're open-minded now there's a few that have researched it, but again, God has to open our eyes to understand scripture because you have to want to know the truth, no matter what, no matter what you have to be willing. You know, I've heard people say, I'll believe truth as long as it's not Christianity. So if the evidence leads you there and you're still willing to see it. So this whole questioning comes from arrogance because they are standing in judgment of God. That comes from a prideful place that we know better than God and we're gonna judge him as immoral. And I think that's interesting because they claim there's no inherent morality in man, that we just learned it from socialism, uh, you know, social environments uh, that we evolved into it. Yet they have that same moral outrage against God, but they'll claim the one that gave them that morality that they're railing against doesn't exist. It's pretty amazing. Very good. I just had one comment I wanted to make on what Ben was saying. Um, there in Hebrews 10, he talks about the sore punishment for those who willfully reject grace. Saved people can't do that. So, you know, the position of entering into his rest is true for saved people. So that's why he had the challenge for other people not to come short of believing the gospel. And so he goes on and, and explains that believing the gospel is, you know, that Christ's sacrifice was better. That's really the whole, um, the whole theme of Hebrews is that Jesus is better. And, and so if people are trying to go back to the law, you know, it says in Hebrews 10, 39, but we are not of them that draw back into perdition. The saved are not of them that draw back, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So, you know, and like what Renee was just saying, you know, before about those that willfully reject that, I mean, there's really no offer, no other offer on the table that God has except Christ. And so if you reject that, you know, there's nothing left and save people can't do that because they've already believed the gospel. Well, I believe they can. I believe they can in time. Um, and again, the saving of the soul is, is about physical life where, where more often than not physical life is, re, is being referred to uh, in those scriptures. And even the Bible uses the, the soul, uh, the animal has a soul. Uh, so it's, it's pressing on to maturity or it's basically press on to maturity or die. Um, but that's not that's not what it's talking about because he's specifically talking about the gospel there in Hebrews chapter ten. Strongly disagree. From, from verse twenty six through twenty nine, really. Well, I'm looking forward to after this uh, discussion on Hebrews, the the time on Wednesday night when we finally reach Hebrews, because uh, Renee and I have made our case that that um, John, Galatians, and Hebrews are our three favorite books. So uh, we'll be finishing up Galatians, work our way through the Pauline epistles, but I am very eager to get to, to Hebrews and uh, then we can rehash all this in more detail. Okay. I would like to say Hebrews is one of the most uh, 
debated scriptures. And Hebrews 6 is listed as one of the top five uh, verses that are difficult. I was doing a, a research on that recently, the Hebrew 6 chapter. Um, okay. Um, I, I did, I was holding back here until everybody was done, but I wanted to point out that uh, when I look at the scripture itself, I'm going to just read the scripture together so that we, because uh, we should have done that in the beginning. It says, verse 22 through 24 says, uh, so the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, go up thou bald head, go up thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear 40 and two children of them. So that's the scriptures, but I'm looking at the footnotes here uh, in the uh, in the Amplified, the footnote says uh, in verse 23, many people in Bethel participated in pagan worship and regarded the prophets of God with contempt. And for verse, uh, another note, it says, this refers to a bald space on the back of the head, which was probably shaved by prophets as a symbol of their sacred separation from ordinary life. So it appears that the boys were not only ridiculing Elisha's baldness, but his prophetic office as well. And there's one footnote in the, uh, in the NABRE. It says, this story probably was told to warn children of the importance of respect for prophets. Hey, Brother Luke, I also looked up the word used there in uh, Hebrew. It's the same word used to describe David when he was a young man being chosen, being anointed. He was, they use the word young lad. So they say it's comparable. So it, it doesn't mean like a, a seven or an eight year old. It's a youthful, a youthful boy. Well, that, that I think that does make a little bit of a difference, doesn't it? If little tiny children are yeah. more, certainly more innocent than a teenager that's yeah, yeah. A, little, are, a little smart aleck. These would be a soldier's age. These would be young lads, the same word. I don't know why they put it as little children. Does it say that in King James? I thought it said youths or something. But it, it even says that in regards to the children of Israel going in the wilderness, too. He called them little children that were 20 and under. Uh, 20 and under. There you go. Interesting point there. Okay. What happened? Luke, you're muted, buddy. Uh, one last point I would say that I think it kind of shuts the deal for the Hebrew thing is um, it talks about uh, the King James is misleading where it says, if any man draws back, if you look at the context, the word any man is not there. And it's talking about the just one. The just one is a righteous person. And it says, if a righteous person draw a righteous person draws back, God has no God has no pleasure in that soul. So it's referring to the just one who's righteous. Uh that's that's inescapable. I believe I believe God knew what he meant when he put it there. I do too. All right. Let's uh uh, I want to read this in the uh, Amplified, this uh, this same three verses here. So the waters have been purified to this day in accordance with the word spoken by Elisha. Then Elisha went up from Jericho to Bethel. On the way, young boys came out of the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. When he turned around and looked at them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord, then two female bears came out of the woods and tore to pieces 42 of the boys. All right, so there's a little distinction. It calls them um, uh, 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 young young boys instead of, uh, uh, in the KJV it says, um, little children. So young boys is different than little children. Let's see in the Amplify what it called in, in the, in, in the Young's literal, it says little youths. Okay. 
All right, let's go to the next question. Okay. Question two is, uh, uh, I have struggled with getting some non-believers to even consider anything the Bible says, especially if they have been hurt in the past within the church. How would you suggest beginning a spiritual conversation with someone who has no confidence in what the Bible says? Uh, Brother Daniel, will you go first on this one? Sure. The Lord draws people through conscience, creation, and the Word of God. So if a person has an, an open heart towards truth without the Word of God, at some point they're going to have to get to the Word of God. So according to their own attitude depends on whether that happens or not. Because God gives everybody according to what they choose. So they may have to start going through some struggles in life. It seems like Lord will, you know, turn up the heat a little bit, so to speak, for people to start seeking them. They start turning to the Lord, like, why is this happening? And so, you know, a lot of times that's just an act of mercy of the Lord to do that. So um, that the, the starting point would be, you know, ask the Lord to show you what you what you need. You know, just start seeking him. I want to know you. Look at creation, you know, and then if you're truly wanting to seek the Lord, the Lord will bring you to the word of God, because the Bible says we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And that's why it's important to have the word of God and understand that, you know, God means what he says and words are, you know, he picks words for a reason and they're unchangeable. Now, you know, we have different opinions on the different versions but um but that's okay but it's just you know when you have a standard of truth if a person's not willing to come to that standard there's really nothing else you can tell them so if they have if they've already responded to the the creation part and they've responded to the draw that god's drawn on their heart to to know more truth if they're not willing to look at the word of God, I really don't know what else you can do for them except just be kind to them. You know, just share the goodness of God, how, how he's been working in your life through different circumstances and just, you know, praise him in the midst of your struggles or whatever, because they, they have struggles too. So if they see you responding in those struggles in a positive way to praise the Lord and give him glory, then they're going to wonder why you're able to do that. And, and that may open up the dialogue to be able to allow you to share some of those scriptures with them. And then if then Lord willing, they'll respond to the, the word of God in that way. So. All right. Thank you. All right. Sister Renee. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. What got me to believe the Bible was not just a, a, a bunch of stuff written by men, so it must have errors. The Bible claims that it is written by men, but they were holy men of God inspired by the Holy Spirit himself. Now, what got me to understand that it's truth, besides a real inquiry into it, if you research it archaeologically, They've never found anything that opposes what scripture says about locations, about uh, tribes. Many of them have, have uh, tried to say the Bible was false and then came back later and said, oh, we were wrong. We actually did find out the Hittites were real. Now they found pottery with Goliath's name on it. So there's a lot of things that are confirming the Bible archaeologically and historically. So we know that it's accurate. In addition, even unbelievers admit that the Gospels are a true eyewitness account due to their scrutiny, because there's the same stories, but told a little differently. If it was just copied by word of mouth, they'd be identical. And then you'd know it was just being perpetrated like that. But this is from different eyewitness views. Also, the main nail in the coffin for me was prophecy. Only God knows the end from the beginning. 
And he gives us so many specific, not vague Nostradamus mess, specific. He even gives us the year Jesus, Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Specific details, like he'd ride on a donkey into Jerusalem, that he they pierced his hands and feet. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And then you start to see God had to have inspired this because there's this was written 750 years before Jesus was even born. They even tell you what gambling game they used for his garments, that they tore some and then gambled for the other one because they didn't want to rip his robe. I mean, you, you can't get... There's no way it's written by man. Now, if a person really wants to know the truth, they need to. I, I'm so sick of people throwing it out, acting like they've done their research. They haven't. Because if you're really looking into it, there is nothing that that is can prove the Bible false. Nothing at all. They have no argument. And that's what uh, eventually got me to understand it is God's word. And if it's God's word, it can be trusted. And it means that Jesus was real. He died for me, was buried and rose again. And I have eternal life. And I have the hope of seeing him face to face and my loved ones. And that, that death is nothing to fear. God loves us. And we do have a purpose because God created us. I believe the Bible. And anybody that actually wants to know truth, they will come to that conclusion. I know it. Yeah, and Renee, people people will willingly believe that Julius Caesar existed with a lot less manuscript evidence, but yeah. you know, they have to question Jesus. Yeah, and there's like, extra, yeah. Biblical, extra biblical historical of Everybody knows, even people that hate him admit he lived. I've heard atheists try to claim he wasn't a real person. I go, now you're sounding stupid because even the atheists confirm he's alive, but that's how much they hate him. And you know what? There's only seven copies of of i think it's the odyssey we've got what twenty six thousand alone of the new testament i think of each new testament book i mean and there there's no discrepancy there there's like a we got it in coptic we got it in coiny greek we there i mean it's so trustworthy you know if they really want to know man i they'll, they'll they'll get there don't you think well <laughs> When I uh, joined YouTube, uh, tw about it was twelve years ago. It was in June of '08. June of '08, yeah. So it's been even longer than that. But uh, um, I thought the very first thing that I needed to do is, um, if I'm going to tell people what the Bible says, uh, I anticipated I was going to get an objection. Well. I don't believe the Bible, so forget about that. So I felt my first duty was uh, to, best way I could, it, to prove the Bible is true. So I made videos and playlists on the subject. Um, and over the years, uh, when the questions come up about this, uh, I will tell someone I have a playlist on that. Uh, science, God and the Bible philosophy in the Bible, prophecies in the Bible. I probably have altogether two or 300 videos on the, between those three playlists that are, are, the intention is really to prove the Bible's true. You can trust it. You can believe it. You should believe it. Uh, and yet how many people over the years who have uh, argued against the Bible have ever taken me up to actually watch the playlists and really uh, consider it, uh, consider all the proof I, I'm offering them. Very few, but there have been some also, I'm thank you, Lord. Uh, there were a few that did follow up and they uh, they looked into it and they, and they became believers. So I have had some people that were staunch atheists and uh, they did uh, listen and eventually they became believers. But that's what I would refer people to is these playlists. Uh, there's tons of information, but um, a lot of the information on those playlists I originally got from some books. This is the subject is called apologetics. Apologetics is 
became very popular in the like the third century of church history. Uh, I was a kind of the age of apologia where uh, that was the, what, what focus was. The, the leaders of the church spent a lot of time writing and trying to defend and coming up with some good answers. But the first book I recommend is uh, A Ready Defense by Josh McDowell. Then um, this is more, uh, this is an earlier book he wrote that's the same kind of a book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, uh, tough, uh, Answers to Tough Questions by Josh McDowell. This book here I used to give out so freely, I almost passed out like tracks. Uh, it's more than a carpenter. And I have several of my friends and family who come to faith just because of this little book. Yes? Dan? Can I ask you a question about that? Um, yeah. I had heard, and I'm not sure, maybe one of you guys can confirm that. I had heard that Josh McDowell was one that just said he doesn't believe anymore now. Is that... Is that I, I haven't heard anything about that. You know, the most recent thing I heard about him is that he finally uh, uh, let everybody know about his childhood, his child abuse he experienced. Uh, that's the only thing I know that was not known before. Okay, I may have been thinking about yeah. somebody else. Daniel, yeah. you, you heard he uh, fell away or something? I had, but I don't. I don't remember. I can't confirm that that was his name. If that was the exact name, I thought that that's. Who it was, but I could be wrong. I'd be, I'd be shocked if that was the case, but uh, uh, we could look into that. But and then there's another one that, and, and by the way, Joshua McDowell and Lee Strobel and many others throughout history, they sought out to disprove the Bible, and the more they they researched it to disprove it, they always became a believer because the evidence is compelling that the Bible's true. Lee Strobel wrote the case for Christ, awesome. the case for faith. And, and uh, so uh, these are some of the books that I would recommend if a person uh, wants to know, can I trust the Bible? Or you can go to those playlists. But uh, the problem for the most people is not the fact that there's not proof available, but they're really just bluffing. They want to mock the Bible and, and dismiss it and act like it's not true, a fairy tale, but they are not willing to spend the time to uh, read these books and go to these playlists. But when they do, it will have an effect on them because the evidence is just too compelling to ignore. Hey, somebody said something in the chat. I just, it's, it's, it's irrelevant, but they were talking about how Jesus's name is used as a curse word. And I just recently noticed, and it, it just hits me constantly. Anytime I'm watching television, somebody's always going, Jesus Christ, and constantly using his name as a swear word. However, at the in a scene where someone's praying, they cut off his name. They'll pray our Father or God, but they won't use Jesus's name at the end of prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray nothing, unless they're setting up a scene where the Christian is really a hypocrite and a, a closet uh, bad guy. Then they'll, they'll use his name freely to show how we're all hypocrites and liars. And they, they there's this campaign against his name and against scripture. And I, I really believe it's just going to get worse and worse to the point where we now see evil is being called good and good is being called evil. What we believe, people, is considered evil and hypocritical and judgmental, intolerant and unloving. Uh, I just saw a scene the other day where the girl grew up Christian, but she goes to this big Christian thing, reveals all these people are hypocrites, and she gets on stage and goes, you know, anybody says they have the answers, they don't. It's not in some book. You can't know for sure. It was like everything just to tear down a Christian's faith. And, and of course, she's the only good one, right, on the show. And you know, now she's a real hero because she finally admitted that it's unloving to preach Jesus to her Hindu neighbor, how unloving that is. So it's it's really sickening right now that the campaign is so against it. And all of us on here have just shown you, there's the, every time somebody really does an honest inquiry into scripture, they come to the truth of it. And they even had a, a guy that was paid by the Imams, I think it was in Afghanistan or Turkey, to prove the Bible wrong. And he was to compare the Quran to the Bible and the guy gets saved 
and he had to run for his life because the imam and his own family were going to kill him. And they are forbidden to read the Bible, which is interesting because their Quran tells them that the, the Old Testament and the Gospels will confirm the Quran, but it doesn't. So they say that ours is corrupt. And so now they're forbidden to even look into the Bible when their own Quran tells them to check our scriptures. So because it's so dangerous that when these people read it, they fall in love with Jesus and they get saved. It's a dangerous book if you want to stay lost. Amen. Amen. Can't help but fall in love with Jesus. I, that's what I think. But uh, b before Brother Ben answers the question, uh, I wanted to tell Daniel that uh, um, Heather put in the in the chat that uh, uh, she says uh, former evangelical leader Josh Harris uh, uh, renounced Christianity. So she thinks you might be thinking of Josh Harris, not Josh. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Uh, all right, brother Ben, what's your answer? Well, I just think it's uh, it just the fact that they don't believe and they and they're willfully uh, suppress the truth is just testament to how true it really is. Because what folly is it for man to reject something and someone who's not against them but for them? Uh, Christ offers them the eternal life. It's the only uh, faith in the world that offers guaranteed eternal life. And that's the only one that that's the that's the religion, or so to speak, that they are most offensive. That find they find most offensive. You would think, you know, that if so, if someone offered me eternal life, it's uh, man has been uh, pursuing the fountain of youth for for eternity, and it's been right, it's been available all along. Um, but you know, again, this is a guaranteed. You don't have to, you don't have to hunt and find it. It's 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 guaranteed that uh, it's guaranteed eternal life. So why why would anyone reject it? Um, Again, it just it, it's a testament to the folly of, of unregenerate, unsaved man. Um, you know, when heaven and hell are at stake, don't you think you owe it to yourself to prove it wrong? And for millennia, uh, every scholar, every major institution, they're pumped in every institution of the world. Every world institution is is designed to get people not to believe it. And, you know, they, they keep on chiseling their hammers and every weapon they try to foment against it, it ends up crushing uh, up to pieces on this on the anvil of truth, and they can't permeate it. And you think they would learn after millennia that nothing can be done about it. And and every person, like you said, just kind of like flattered, for example, you try to prove it wrong, and yet become becoming a believer if you pursue it honestly. I believe, uh, and I'm, I probably shouldn't throw the flattered in there. I apologize, but uh, same principle though. Um, that again, you, you can't, it can't be proven wrong. Uh, in fact, you, you realize now as as you realize the more you investigate. How true it really is, and the the it, it reminds me of what P, I think it was Peter who said, you know, uh, unless you consider yourself unworthy for eternal life, and then he also said, uh, beware therefore lest, uh, basically says, uh, friends, beware therefore lest what has been spoken in the prophets that comes upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a, I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Um, and, and in fact, that's a lot of the reasons unbelievers reject the Bible says, well, I didn't hear that. I don't hear, uh, I don't hear all these great scientists, all these great minds talking about it. If, if they knew if they're smarter than all of us. And so if they were, if it was true, I certainly would have heard it from them. Uh, someone would have told us by now. Um, so again, they reject it to their own peril and it, it's, it's folly. And uh, it, 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 it it's a real testament to the truthfulness, actually, the, 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 the fact that they would reject guaranteed eternal life. They would owe it to themselves to look into it. Um, and, you know, they could reject reality. Like I could say, well, if I if I, do, uh, I don't believe that I'll get fat if I eat a bunch of junk food eat as much as I want. Well, you could you could deny reality, but uh, reality ultimately will catch up to you. So, yeah, I think of that uh, verse professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. That's what I comes to mind when you said that about the scientists yeah yes very true um i guess i'll add one more thing to think about regarding this this question uh i found that um uh, there, there are some people i've encountered who for the most part uh they just laugh and ridicule the bible and christianity and when they deal with christians as a whole they pretty much 
get their way with them because very few Christians uh, are equipped. They're not ready with an answer, unfortunately. And uh, But to me, uh, what, what stands out to me in my experiences with them is uh, not that I have an answer to make them trust the Bible in, the, in just a minute. No, to, in order to, to reach that point, they would have to invest hours of study in, in these books and playlists uh, to, to overcome all their, their concerns about, uh, you know, uh, is the Bible historically correct, scientifically correct, archaeologically correct, all these things. It takes time to get all that resolved. Uh, but if they invest the time, they'll, they'll change their mind. But in the meantime, I have had success opening their eyes to the gospel. Because what I found is that almost none of them have actually ever heard the real gospel. So when I, 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 I hear this from people, after I tell them the real gospel, they said, are you kidding me? That's in the Bible? They're amazed. That's why I call it the, the, uh, the, uh, the amazing good news. Because they're amazed when they hear it because it's so foreign to them. It's almost like in churches, they've kept it a secret from people, the free gift and the guarantee of eternal life. All right, anybody want to say more before we go go to the next question? Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Just, I was just going to say, it's just sad to say this because most so-called Christians aren't saved. Yep. There, there's few there be that find it. Yep. I, I was just going to say that, Daniel, when you were talking about that Josh guy and Heather found his name, when she said he was an evangelical pastor, I would bet anything even though they use the words grace through faith, they really don't believe it. They really think God's grace is exactly. not giving them the ability to live righteous enough to get saved or their lifelong living good is getting them into heaven. And I see pastors like this all the time turning to atheism. There's an atheist that debates and claim to have been a pastor and evangelical. But when you hear him, he still thinks it's, all about rules and if you don't live good enough he'll throw you into hell that's not the gospel message so this man was a preacher and is now a atheist fighting against christianity because he was never saved that man there's no way he was ever saved if he thinks it's you got to live a certain way or it'll throw you into hell because sin was taken care of on the cross and he just doesn't understand the gospel and I, I've said before, the hardest people to get saved are those that think they already are. They're filling up the church pews and they're really hard to, because what like Brother Luke was preaching to somebody that never heard it, they might believe it. But the people sitting in the churches, they won't because they've heard Jesus on the cross so long that they think of Jesus plus you're living right, getting you saved. And they will reject the gospel over and over. And it's horrifying. It is horrifying to me how many really cannot get and, and not just don't get it, hate the gospel message. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that's, that's generally what we see. You have people that have a form of godliness. They, they, I like, I like what brother Luke says about Christianity. Christianity is different than what we see as Christianity or churchianity. The most, most point. So the fact that most of these people never were saved. I mean, all of these people, in my opinion, never were saved to be able to go to this, to that point of saying they don't even believe anymore. It's just, you know, you have to deny the reality if you actually believed it, which they never did. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, I don't remember where we are now. Uh, has everybody answered this question or are we just getting started? I think we're ready to go to the next one. I could okay. be wrong, but all right, yeah. Let's go to the, let's go to the next question then. Question three says: uh, Taking into consideration Noah's flood and the nations that the Israelites defeated as they came into the Promised Land, namely the fact that children and babies died in these judgments, should we assume that the children of non-believing parents will not be raptured? Okay, Sister Renee. Uh, okay. No. <laughs> no, because although the flood is used as a picture of salvation, 
uh, there was so much going on there with the whole Genesis 6 thing and God having to wipe out most humanity, which was corrupted genetically. I truly believe that. In addition, the ones that if they weren't, they were so wicked and satanic. Uh, it was a mess. Uh, so uh, children, uh, I believe we don't know the age, but they're covered by the blood of Jesus. I believe that wholeheartedly. God is a just God. Jesus is died to save us. And I think only when you get to the a certain age where you're openly, willingly reject Jesus' sacrifice for you is is you being left behind. Now there there is no whether you believe the rapture is the second coming, it's the same thing, or if you think it's a separate event, what it is, the the gathering together of the saints is the glorification of the body. The saints that have died in Christ or gone to sleep in Christ will get their glorified bodies and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together and we will be changed. So that event is just the final promise of our salvation. And you're either saved and in the body of Christ or you are not. Uh, and then you get the glorified body. You're in Christ by faith. And glorification is a promise for whom he justified, he also glorified. So as far as children go, uh, why would why would God leave them behind? Like, I, I don't I, I still can't say with certainty there's a good argument for both. And I cannot, you know, fully step out and say who's right on this. If the rapture and the second coming are the same thing or if it's a separate event, the snatching away of the saints are two separate events. But in any case, if a child is below that age of accountability, whatever that may be, we leave it to God's judgment. I do not believe. No, I don't believe he's going to leave anyone. But the ones that are still here, we continue to go on at the end. If if this happens at the end of when Jesus returns, they're still going to be alive. I mean, little children will probably still be alive. We know there's some people that grow up in the kingdom. They're still mortal because uh, they keep having children and it'll be a shame to die at 100 years old. They'll be considered young and that kind of thing. So, no, I, I don't. How about we just answer this? All children are saved until they are old enough to openly reject Christ. That's what I believe. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Ben, will you go next? Sure. Um, so, uh, will they be raptured? Uh, again, that that's that's kind of debatable. I mean, uh, again, I, I often think, as Renee does, that uh, at a certain point in time, there's a point of, of where uh, children are basically under their the protection of first Corinthians seven says that uh, 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 children of a believing spouse are holy or set apart. Um, and I, I believe that I think that's kind of, that's the kind of same principle I see in the old Testament too, where a sacrifice was brought before um, for a family. And it was the head, the head, anytime a, a child is, is under the headship of, of a father um, that, that, that again, that, that uh, they're sanctified in that sense by, because of the believing father, um, uh, or or mother, but you know whatever it may be. But again, uh, there's a point in time where you know it's kids are so if, if kids are exposed to such evil, there's no there's no recovering. You, they can't recover from that psychologically. I mean, their spirit is damaged to a point where I don't think they could live a normal life. And uh, taking them out early is a I think is an act of mercy. And I'm sure there was just atrocious, heinous sins going on be, before the flood, and just like there were in the Old Testament uh, in the uh, Joshua's conquest that those kids had children that saw titanious things that there's no recovery from it, essentially. Um, and it doesn't, it, again, I think the judgment, the Old Testament is a, I think is a picture of the final judgment, but I think it's a stretch to say, oh, it's an exact parallel to exactly what's going to happen um, in, in, in the final judgment. Uh, it, it very it very well could be possible. I'm not saying it is, but I, I, I hold out this possibility that there were some saved believers that were killed in the flood because they, they did not heed what, uh, uh, Noah, they were overcome by evil. They didn't persist in the faith. Again, not saying it is the case, but um, it's it's telling that. I mean, it, it, I find it somewhat difficult to believe that there's that many people in the world at that time that, that never believed. 
Um, in fact, if you look at some of the gene genealogies, it would seem some of the other patriarchs might have even been alive at that point. Um, I don't know. It depends if you hold that to Usher's chronology or not, which I tend not to. But so, yes, I, I think, um, again, it, when you ever see death of the Old Testament, it doesn't nece necessarily mean uh, it's a picture of uh, eternal damnation. Uh, it's a picture of just saying that sin, uh, especially grievous sin, re absolute rebellious sin is a picture of of what death is if you reject christ essentially that's the ultimate sin that is it's not it's an unpardoned sin not unpardonable but it's unpardoned because you never uh came in it, you never walked through that door uh eternity is a one-way door once you enter in you can't enter exit out uh, even if you stop believing um and so uh yes i don't i i, don't, I really don't know about what the rapture is it, it's a very it's a real possibility i i would hold up that possibility that uh Oh, children of non-believing parents. I'm sorry. Um, again, I, I, I think God's going to be merciful in that, in that time. Um, and there could be circumstances where, who knows, maybe there won't even be children alive at that time. Um, there's just so many things that we don't know and can't know. And so it's difficult to be dogmatic about any of this. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Brother Daniel. Yeah, uh, that's that's really a good question. Um, I, I am with Renee on the fact that I believe children are safe until they go their own way, the way that seemeth right unto a man, which is I've got to do right to please God. That's when a person falls from grace, according to Galatians 5, 4. At that point, they have to believe to uh, be saved. But children of non-believing or, or, or believing parents are still, uh, you know, in the same category, I believe. So whether they'll be raptured out or whether they stay because they, they're they safe. And even if they're killed in that time, they still go to heaven. You know, that's really up to the Lord. So I, I don't really know. So that, that's definitely a good question. Well, I, I find this question... Um quite confusing uh, because of the way it's written. So let me make a couple of points and maybe someone can help me to understand really what this question is. Uh, okay, first it starts out talking about the flood and the death. So it says, taking into consideration Noah's flood and the nations that the Israelites defeated as they came into the promised land, namely the fact that children and babies died in these judgments. So this is the premise that, okay, what about the children who died uh, uh, during the flood and in these wars against Israel, the children of the uh, non-believers? Uh, should we assume that the children of non-believing parents will not be raptured? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, first of all, um, the rapture is uh, of believers. Uh, so if you're, if you're thinking that the children are going to be raptured, then you're thinking that they either believed or they're covered until that age of accountability, and therefore they would be raptured. But um, I'm not sure why raptured is, is part of the question. It seems to me the question should be, should we assume that the children of non-believing parents will be saved or lost, or whatever? But when you when you write the question in this way, where you said, "Should we assume?" Um, I think assuming is quite a dangerous thing to do uh, in our Bible. Um, that that's why um, there are certain doctrines that I I uh, am quite dogmatic and, and say not only is the Bible so clear on this that. It, there's no ambiguity at all. It's explicitly stated, not once, but over and over and over again. And this particular doctrine is an essential doctrine. So I not only insist it's correct, but I insist that we have to agree. But uh, there's much else in the Bible, though, that is not so clear. It, it, it's not so explicit. In fact, it could be quite ambiguous. In fact, sometimes the Bible is completely silent. And, and, and sometimes it says so little. And in this case, it says so little. I've asked people, and if any, I'll ask again, if anybody now can give me more verses 
uh, that, uh, that we could use to support this um, age of accountability. I, I want to know uh, what verses uh, that are being used uh, to uh, support it. Because as far as I know, the only thing I've ever been able to find is the one verse about David seeing, you know, look, saying he's going to see his son again. Uh, but that is very little said in that one verse. And then to extrapolate from that verse an entire doctrine and build a doctrine around that one verse uh, it seems to be uh, not a sound biblical approach to form a doctrine, and for that reason, I cannot, uh, I cannot, uh, you know, have a doctrine without more information to base it on. Um, so, um, but I'm a little confused about the way the question's written. Uh, but that's my problem. I would suggest that we we shouldn't be assuming uh, anything. Uh, why don't we why don't we limit our conclusions to to what is clearly stated uh, unless it's if it's really if it is vague and we want to speculate and discuss it and try to figure it out but uh, otherwise uh, assuming you know what they say about that word assume I don't need to repeat that publicly but you know what they say about someone who assumes all right anybody want to say more Uh, one thing I would just say is that, uh, again, uh, they some someone objected to the, the idea that uh, there could have been saved believers in the Noah's flood. I, I, I seriously, I tend to think that I doubt there was. But in Revelation, it talks about it, God saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. Um, so if they don't heed that, they then obviously they, by implication, they will receive those plagues. Not It's not intended for them, but if they don't, uh, if they don't, you know, if they don't move forward. Uh, they, they can, uh, they, they want to, you know, stay spiritually sag, stagnant and, and married to the world, if it, as it were, even though they're saved, they can't experience God's uh, judgment intended for unbelievers on a temporal basis. So there's biblical precedent for that. I think there's a number of uh, cases in, in the Bible for that. I guess we'll go to the next question then. Uh... Question four is, uh, some try to refute John 6, 40, where Jesus is saying that they have eternal life and he will raise them up at the last day by saying that's on the condition that you continue in the faith. Then use Romans 11 about continuing in his kindness and Hebrews 3 about steadfastly holding on to our confidence firmly until the end of and and use Old Testament verses where God rejected Israel when they were in gross rebellion, their argument is that God will never let you go as long as you abide in his love. Uh, please refute this argument. Okay, uh, Ben, will you, you want to go first on this one? Uh, sure. Um, the Bible makes many illustrations of the simplicity of faith and uh and it never talks about, you know, less than saving faith. It just says you have faith. In fact, the faith is, uh, I believe the faith is, um, it's not the, that, not the quality of the faith. It's not the, it's not the quality of one's faith. That The weakest faith in a saving object can save anything. It's, 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 uh, it's losing the focus on Christ and what his finished work is. Faith is simply the means at which we access that, that promise. Um, and so, again, the weakest faith in, in a, in a uh, the strongest faith in an unworthy object can't save anybody, but the weakest faith in the strong in the strongest object can save anybody. Uh, and, and there's, I know the verses about being fully persuaded and things like that. And I do believe you do have to exercise faith. You, it's, it's, you believe or you don't. Um, and fully persuaded uh, essentially is meant that you know you don't you've ruled out any other possibility. You, you've ruled out any law keeping or any other or any other person of means of salvation. Your all your focus is all your hope um, and all your faith is in Christ alone. Um, but the Bible never really talks about different degrees of faith. I think that's very telling. Um, and even Abraham, who was fully persuaded later, uh, obviously doubted God's promise of, of the forthcoming child and, and had relations with uh, the slave woman. Um, and the Bible makes a lot of illustrations about the simplicity and the irrevocability of of salvation where it talks about look you know just like uh, uh, Moses held the uh, serpent on the pole all they had to do was look one time and believe it 
and they were cured. They did not have to keep on looking forever uh, to, to maintain their salvation or, or if they stopped looking, they would become poisoned again. Uh, same thing with uh, the, the Jesus talked about the woman at the well. They She hit, just had a sip that uh, that would be enough to uh, spring in her uh, wells of eternal life. Um, and even if you look at the Greek, the, if you look at the, the pistuo and, and uh uh, you look at the Greek, all those verses that a lot of people say that uh, uh, teach that you must uh, believe uh, uh, forever or, or never stop believing. Um, if you look at the Greek, that that's refuted that way. One great book, by the way, if you're interested in that, uh, it's called um, uh, it's called Must Faith Endure for Salvation to Be, to be Sure. So again, must faith endure for salvation to be sure. And it's the, the tagline is a biblical study of the preser perseverance of the saints versus the preservation of the saints. And the Bible does not teach the per perseverance of the saints. That's a very Calvinistic idea. I think it's very dangerous. Um, and, but the Bible does teach the preservation of the saints. Uh, Jude says you're preserved in him. Um, and there's many, many other verses as well. Um uh, also, too, again, the Bible uses the word believer almost like a title, like you're an overcomer. So if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, as John says, then you've overcome the world. And it's it's, not, it's a title that you hold forever. Just like you, as a sinner, you held all those sin titles, like a liar, uh, your, your adulterer, all those titles you had affixed to you. Once you believe in God's sight, all you are is a believer, an overcomer. Those are titles. They're, they're permanent uh, fixtures. That's all that God sees in you. Uh, through the new birth. So, um, again, uh, I think the Bible is overwhelmingly clear that uh, uh, that you don't have to have a constancy of faith, um, and that if you if you fail to do that, you, you were a false convert. Um, there's many verses that uh, I believe refute that. So, that's my answer. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Sister Renee. What do you say? Well. One of the things I don't think people understand is salvation is the event of a birth. Um, when you hear the gospel, it says, in whom ye also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So at the moment of the rebirth, Jesus said, you must be born again. Paul constantly talks about how they were dead and they were quickened together in the spirit, right? So when you believed the gospel, you became a child of God. You were born into God's family. Now, once you were born into God's family, you can't be unborn. You have the spirit of Christ in you, the spirit of eternal life. It is eternal. Nothing will snatch you out of his hands. Nothing will snatch you out of the father's hands. You can be a rebellious child. You can suffer consequences. You can have a crisis, but it's a birth. And so when somebody really understands it, God has given them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. They see it. it we don't have faith in our faith. Everybody has faith in something. Some people trust they're good enough to get to heaven. I'm not a, I'm not a murderer, even though hatred is considered murder, just as bad to God. Uh, they all think you can trust in that and it won't save you. Ben, ben said you could have a ton of faith. Hey, Muslims are so, uh, they believe that mess so much, they're willing to blow themselves up to guarantee paradise. But it doesn't mean they're saved. And so it's the object of our faith. And once the object of your faith has shown you that's the way to salvation, I mean, that there, there, you can't be undone because salvation is a birth process. And, and John tells us, uh, tell you these things that believe on the name of the Son of God, so you can know that you have eternal life. And so that's the gospel message, that you have eternal life because Christ died on Calvary, paid your sin debt, and now he gave you his righteousness uh, because you believe the message. I mean, the gospel is the message of what's been done, that salvation is offered freely by God's grace through faith in the redemptive work of Christ. So... If a person gets that, they receive that message, truly, they are born of God. There is no undoing that. And it does say that we're preserved of God. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. God keeps us. God is our salvation. And so I, I don't, 
you know, if somebody gets a crisis of faith, did they lose their salvation? Were they never saved? I'm not going to debate that. What I'm going to say is right now, like you said, Brother Luke, you're not believing now. And so what is it? What is it that has given you this faith crisis? If you ever trusted Christ as Savior and what he did, why are you not believing that now? Let's get to that. But if you were born of God, you were born. You can't undo a birth. It's just not possible. And that's the reason we sing praises and songs like blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. I am his and he's mine. It's net. It, you notice when he says, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and that in your name? He said, depart from me. I never knew you worker of iniquity. You want you, you want to rely on your works. He's not going to know you. You got to trust in him. So no salvation uh, uh, cannot be lost. And anybody that fights against our eternal security does not understand that salvation is an event. It is a birth. And what happens after that birth? We're supposed to grow in grace through the milk of the word and serve our Lord and live for the Lord so that we don't give the church a bad name and give God a bad name. And we serve a purpose in our lives. Uh, but, you know, we, we can't, first of all, we can't judge people whether they're saved or not on how they live. Uh, we can only take them at their word. And if they say they've trusted Christ, they're born of God. They are born of God and it cannot be undone. And anybody that comes against it does not understand the gospel. Okay. Amen. All right, Brother Daniel. All right. Let's let's look at a few scriptures because the scriptures is the best answer for everything. Um, I think one of the big, you know, the, the big point is that there's a lot of people that claim to be saved and they're not. Obviously, if anybody's truly saved, there's nothing that can change that. But let's look at a few scriptures over here in Hebrews chapter 6. Because this is one of the scriptures that was brought up um, about uh, the confidence and things. Let's see here. All right. Let's, let's go back to verse 11. Hebrews 6, 11. It says, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope and to the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So what is that patiently enduring? What was he, what was he patiently enduring? Well, the Lord tells us over in Matthew chapter 11, verse uh, 28 through 30, it says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest in your souls. Well, Abraham began learning about the Lord in Genesis 12. And it says, when God called him, according to Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham went out, not knowing whether he went. So he had faith and he believed God when God told him to leave. But a person's not saved by believing they need to go somewhere God tells them to go. We see Abraham called upon the name of the Lord in Genesis 12, 7. Verse 8, he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. But it wasn't until Genesis 15, 6, where it says, and he believed in the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So he patiently endured learning, going from faith to faith, believing God. God called him out. God started preaching him the gospel there in Genesis 12. And he patiently endured until in Genesis 15, 6, he believed in the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So the challenge in the book of Hebrews is all, it's always the same from chapter four, challenging those not to come short of believing the gospel. He said that those who didn't enter, they, 
they didn't have faith mixed. I don't know how uh, the exact wording there in Hebrews 4 1, but it didn't profit them. The, the gospel preached to them didn't profit them not being mixed with faith and them that heard it. You said, well, you know, the Bible says people have faith, and they do. People can have faith for a while, believe for a while in the parable of the sower. But then it also says, but by and by, because of the word, they're offended. Now, according to Matthew 18, he talks about being offended. And he's talking about it's, you know, if your hand offend you, cut it off. Because it's better to enter into life, halt and maimed, than to be cast into hell fire. So those children, it says those children that believe on me, if any one of the if any one of you offend one of these children that believe in me, that offending is causing them to turn away from the gospel or they go to hell. Because he says that later. So can a person be in faith but not fully persuaded? Absolutely, because it happens all the time. And in John chapter 8, God gives an example here in verse 30. It says, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. It's very important to see that God was specific on who he was addressing. So you can get the real picture. He says, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What were they being, what, why do they need to be made free? That's what knowing the truth is. You're made free. The truth shall make you free. You believe. Well, then they said, well, we're of Abraham's seed. We're not in bondage to any man. And so you follow the thought down to verse 44. Jesus tells the same people he's just talking to, you're of your father, the devil. See, they believed on him. They trust. Some of them trusted on him that he would deliver them. Like he said in Luke 24. And Jesus said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You can believe a lot of truth without believing the truth. So back over, back over in Hebrews chapter 10, he makes the case of, uh, you know, rejecting the gospel there. And um, as far as sinning willfully against the knowledge of the truth, that's those aren't saved people. Um if you go on, he says in verse 29 of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. See, how do we know who's sanctified? Well, according to verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Well, who did he offer his body for? The whole world. So the whole world sanctified. According to verse 14, it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So God's telling the world that he's perfected the whole world through that offering. Will man believe it? No. Why? They reject it. You look at verse, uh, go on down to verse 38. He, he, he uh, quotes that passage in Habakkuk. It says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. He says, but we are not of them who draw back into perdition. That perdition is being lost. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. See, when a person, a person draws back from that faith, See, they could be in the faith for a little while, but not be fully persuaded. See, Romans 4 interchanges the words fully persuaded in verse 21. Verse 3, uh, believe in God. Or verse 5, believe in God. And then verse another one that says faith. Faith, believing, and fully persuaded are equal in Romans chapter 4. And he says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. See, Abraham wasn't fully persuaded that what he promised God, he would be able to perform it. He, he was like, Man, I'm old. I can't have no kids. God said, you're going to have a son. 
And he was fully persuaded that that seed, according to Galatians chapter 3, that seed was Christ. And that seed would bless the whole world because he was going to die for the sins of the whole world. So Abraham, according to Hebrews 6, patiently endured that teaching until he believed in the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. See, the Bible says in uh, Hebrews 11, 1, through faith, or not, not, verse 1, I think it's uh, maybe verse 2. Yeah, verse 2. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Well, are we saved because we believe that God made the world? No. But is that is that something that a person must believe before they can believe the gospel? Yeah. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But God says a person has to know that the person they're looking to, the Lord, from his word, has the truth, and he must be fully persuaded of that truth. And that's believing. Once right. you, and then also, hey, Daniel, Daniel yeah. let, me, let me interrupt because I have to keep this as a discussion rather than a lecture. So, <laughs> okay. You know, I wanted to give you plenty of time, but I know that really this is your your mission statement. And, and so you could probably preach on this for an hour nonstop easily. But this has to be remain a discussion. So let, let me I haven't had a turn yet. So let me have a turn to, to comment. All right. Go ahead. Um, well, the idea that uh, um, a person cannot lose their salvation is there's no dispute. Uh, we, we all agree that uh, when you're born again, you, that cannot be undone. It, it can't be reversed. It's irrevocable. Uh, so there's no disagreement there. The, the, the question is, what about all the professors uh, who uh, uh, later either go into apostasy or lose their faith or have a crisis of faith? Um, uh, what is their standing? Did, did they ever get saved, really? Or were they uh, making a false profession? Either a wolf pretending to be a sheep um, or a, a tear that looked very much like wheat, but there's something wrong that's, uh, that definitely makes it not wheat. So um, we know that, and I happen to believe, and I think most of us agree, that probably... This might not be right to put a number on it, but I think probably 90% of, of the professors, the people who say, I'm a Christian of some kind, probably 90% of those, I think, uh, couldn't even tell you what the gospel is. Uh, so we, we know that there are many wolves in sheep clothing. There's much, many tares uh, sitting along the wheat with the wheat and the pews. That's, it, it, that's beyond dispute. We agree with that. What What... What I object to and I encourage is, is um, since I do not believe it's possible for uh, us to determine if someone actually got saved last year or 20 years ago and now have elapsed out of the faith or got led into apostasy, uh, I don't think any of us can actually determine if they really got saved or not. So why can't we just... Um, not even broach the subject since we can't really determine it. I mean, uh, Daniel, and you could give us an hour lecture proving your, your point, uh, and yet we spent several hours just on the book of Galatians, and we believe that the book of Galatians completely re refutes that, that, that point, that the, that book is written entirely to uh, people who were truly believers, truly saved, who have gone in apostate. So uh, we can try to prove our points with the scriptures, but I, what I'm encouraging is, why don't we just agree to focus on this problem? Um, if someone is not expressing uh, you know, doubts about their salvation or, or any apostasy, why do we need to uh, preach on that since there, there's apparently not a problem? Uh, but when we do encounter the person, that says that they no longer believe or they're having troubles believing or they're worried about their salvation or they're, they've added some kind of work to, the, to grace, um, then we can all agree a problem exists. They do not believe the gospel. Now, 
I'm not going to say they believed it in the past and they didn't. I'm not going to say absolutely one way or the other, uh, but I will say absolutely. They do not believe the gospel. If they cannot tell me right now, I'm certain I have eternal life and I'm going to heaven because Jesus paid it all for me and he promised me eternal life. It's that simple. And if they can't make that uh, claim, uh, then if, if they do make that claim, I'm going to be satisfied. But if they can't, then I can say they're not a believer and I'll deal with the problem. We all need to do. We don't want to ignore the problem. We don't want to sweep it under the rug and act like there's no problem at all because well, they say they got saved 20 years ago. We can't count on that. All we can count on right now is that they are not confessing their faith right now, so they're not a believer right now. And that's what I would encourage the approach for everybody to take. Um, all right. Um, let me see. We've run out of time for questions, but if, let's see if anybody wants to say more on this subject before we start finishing up. Yeah, I just wanted to mention 1 Corinthians 15 talks about people believing in vain. So... That is a thing that we have to deal with. And and I think we would all agree on this, that our focus is, like he said in, in Hebrews, that people show the diligence to the full assurance of faith. We want people to be fully persuaded. I am. First John 5.20 says, And we know the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true even in the son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. I want people to have the same thing I have. And I know I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did. And, and I, you know, I just want people to know the same thing. Let me ask you a follow up question about Abraham. As you were talking, I was thinking, uh, Ben mentioned it, but uh, uh, after uh, chapter 15, uh, this is when you, you say that he uh, believed to get salvation. Uh, was was it after that 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 uh, he and uh, uh, Sarah uh, did not believe God's promise and decided to uh, take matters into their own hands and have a child rather than waiting on the Lord? And it seems to me that they lost their faith in God to keep that promise. No, but I actually, Abraham, you know, just listened to his wife. Maybe she had a problem with it, but. He believed he was going to have a son and maybe he thought that was the way it was going to happen because it was still his son. So he shouldn't have listened to his wife, though, in that instance. One thing I would say, too, is that uh, Abraham, God believed and he, you know, got, uh, Abraham believed God earlier on. Uh, yes, just like the Jews believed God, but they didn't. It was only when God, uh, Abraham believed the saving message, which Paul refers to as the gospel. That's when he was saved. So, yes, you could believe God. But if you have the right message that you believe in, then that doesn't count for righteousness. So just believing in God, I think we would all agree, is not accounted for righteousness. It's when you believe God on the saving message. And that's why it was only then that uh, Abraham was accounted for righteousness. It's not like his faith was uh, different, perhaps, or uh, you know, uh, fully persuaded at that point. There's nothing in the Bible or there's nothing in the, yeah, there's nothing in the account that would, that would suggest that at all. So I think that's reading into the text. Um, and I agree, I agree. I agree. I agree that we all want to have the same. Uh, have the all. We all want to have the same uh, uh, result for everyone. We totally agree in, in full assurance. I, no one's arguing against that at all. However, uh, the only way to get that at full assurance is by showing them and addressing their doubts and uh, overcoming uh, some of their the things that they struggle with. Not uh, you know keep on saying, "Well, you're not saved yet." And I, I believe again that's it's gift faith, and that's it's inescapable to me. Uh, it's it's Calvinism. Uh, right. It's a different form of Calvinism, but it's Calvinism. But Abraham, when he was fully persuaded, that's when it was counted to him for righteousness. And that's what that the, all those passages were saying. He believed the gospel exactly. He, that, that was the point. He actually believed it. There's a lot of people that say they believe, but they don't. And instead of going back and trying to reinforce that they're okay, I'm, I can't take, I'm not going to play Russian roulette with somebody's soul. Yeah. I don't know anybody uh, in this congregation, is particularly anybody in the leadership of the congregation, I don't know anybody who is reassuring someone, if they say they doubt their salvation, we are not reassuring them and say, oh, don't worry about it, you got saved 20 years ago. Yeah, no, no one's saying a brace your doubts. None of us would ever endorse that approach. No. I would say that if, if I become aware that someone here was doubting their salvation, I would say, uh, I'm sorry to hear that you don't believe the gospel and take it from there. 
Um, all right, let's start uh, giving up our, our final uh, remarks here and finish up here. Um, Brother I, Daniel, can I, can I, oh, Ray. I just want to reaffirm what the gospel message is. The gospel message is that Christ died for your sins, meaning your sin debt is paid. He was buried. He rose again the third day, proving that you will too. And that if you trust that he did that, you have eternal life. That's the gospel message. So if you don't believe you have eternal life, that you've been saved from the penalty of your sin and will not come into condemnation because of the work of Jesus, you do not believe the gospel. That is the gospel message. Yeah. Amen. Sadly, most Christians don't believe the gospel because they still think salvation has something to do with how they're performing, how faithful they are, how big they are. And it has nothing at all to do with that. So we, we got to remember what that gospel is. And uh, like Daniel was saying in 1 Corinthians 15, they were believing in vain. That what they were believing in vain is that Christ didn't rise. And Paul is saying, if you don't believe part of the gospel, you're believing in vain. Because if you deny the resurrection of Jesus, then we are yet in our sins. And our faith is in vain. Mm -hmm. But we did rise again. So your faith is not in vain, but you can't remove part of the gospel and it still be a saving message. And mm -hmm. you have to believe all of it. Mm -hmm. And believing all of it means that you believe he not just died, but paid your sin debt and rose again to give you eternal life. Mm -hmm. That's the message. Amen. Um, all right. Um, Daniel, uh, do you have another song left in you? Sure. Okay. Okay. Could you finish with a song? Let me ask uh, Renee to uh, give a, a gospel message. Uh, I'll come up with an exhortation, and we'll start with Ben here. And Ben, you can uh, begin with your uh, summary and closing remarks. Um, well, I, I was ready to give the gospel, but I can do it next week. No problem. That, that's, oh uh, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. So you go. You can go ahead and give the gospel, and if that's all right, Renee, do you, do you object? Is that all right? Oh, no, that's fine. Absolutely. All right. Go ahead. So that means that, uh, uh, Renee, uh, you and I will go last. Go ahead and give the gospel. And then, Renee, why don't you give an exhortation instead of me? Can you come think of anything encouraging for the congregation? I can think of something. All right. Good. Okay. So go ahead, uh, Ben, you give the, uh, the gospel. And first, give us a summary on the talk. Well, there's some very, very challenging questions today, uh, for sure. Um, and again, I think, like Luke said, we all agree that every we want assurance for everyone. We want uh, we want zero episodes of doubt. Um, and in my early days, I uh, I did doubt a little bit. Actually, I didn't really, frankly, doubt. I I I feared that I doubt. I fear that I doubted. And I think that's what most people are. They actually fear that doubt when there's really they don't doubt. But they think again, as a newborn Christian, you're you're. Uh, uh, you, you think that uh, somehow your feelings are a factor into it somehow, or if you have negative thoughts or something that uh, you're, you're doubting, all kinds of things that Satan will try to try to bring at you, sling at you. Um, and all the things that I, that I was, I, fe I feared that I doubt what I had doubt over were things that God turned into strengths. So I'm not suggesting, and I know no one else here is just suggesting that you embrace your doubts or, you know, love your doubts. No one's saying that at all. But don't don't deny your doubts. If you think they're really doubts, don't deny them or any area that in your in your faith that bothers you. Uh, seek the Lord. And I, I, I mean, one of the things I thought would never happen. <laughs> in fact, I doubted this would happen is that I, I doubted that I would ever overcome some of these uh, issues that I had. Um, and I can go into more detail about, about that later. But all those things that, that I uh, that bothered me, all those soft spots, if you will. Again, that I thought were doubts for me personally. I'm just talking about me personally. They weren't really doubts, but they were. I felt like the. I, I if I couldn't explain them, then how could I? How could I? Uh, if I couldn't explain them, then how you know it, it was a, a shadow essentially in my in my walk that I, I didn't like that any shadow of understanding. Uh, I wanted my understanding to be clear. And over time, God let me shine light on those things, and he, and actually the very things that bothered me, God turned into strengths. They, he turned them into strength so that now, um, again, I, I do, uh, you know, I don't have any doubt. I don't even think about whether I doubt or not anymore. But back in the early days, I, I think everyone uh, 
wonders do they doubt or um, wrestles with various uh, things that they, you know they feel like wow I, I I can't explain this is that doubt or how can I really be I believe like the, the face it the Bible's strange just strange the flood uh, Noah's Ark uh, Jonah being swallowed by a whale uh, those things sound strange and it's like okay sometimes it's, it, it hits you it's like whoa I, I believe it but it, it's so strange how can I possibly believe it it's, it's kind of that kind of thing and so um, I think w w when we, we we dwell on people's doubts. Um, especially for new people, uh, new believers, or you know, vulnerable new believers, uh, we turn them away when we say, uh, uh, "If you ever doubt, uh, you're still not saved," or "If you have a, a lapse in faith, you're not saved." First of all, I think it's unbi 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 unbiblical, and it actually draws people away. And ultimately, I think it 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 it, it keeps people unsaved because they could never know. Uh, have I exercised the length of time that would indicate that uh, I uh, have I have shown that I really do believe? Um, or um, you know, if, 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 where's the threshold? How long must I believe? Or, or how much? How much doubt can there be? It makes no sense. It's unbiblical, and um, I, I, that's why I think it hurts people. That's the only reason I'm against it. I'm not uh, trying to be uh, uh, co difficult or complicated, but I think it really does hurt people, and I think it's unbiblical. And I think the verses that are used to support it are out of context. Um, so again, uh, it was a good discussion this uh, today. And um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to next week. Luke, are you muted? You're muted, Luke. Yes, I was muted because I'm listening to you. Are you finished? You didn't give the gospel. Oh, you want me to give the gospel? Okay, right now? Yeah, I thought you were going to give the gospel. Okay, I'll do that right now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, I like to take it back to Genesis because Genesis is where it all began. And it, it shows us one of the early lessons you learn in, in Genesis, even before you learn about man, is you learn about um, how all things beget after its own kind. And we, I think we'd all agree that we don't none of us agree, uh, believe in evolution. Uh, you know, a dog can only beget a dog. A cat can only beget a cat. Um, good fruit can only beget good fruit. Rotten fruit can only beget rotten fruit. Um and this is where uh, I think this is important to understand is that when uh, Adam and Eve sinned, they it, it also too prior to this uh, uh, this this lesson in Genesis about things giving after its own kind. It talks about uh, how uh, how Adam and Eve knew each other, so it's an intimacy. And when they knew each other, they they became one flesh, and their ch their children were the result of that. And in the same way, when uh, Adam and Eve sinned, they, uh, they essentially, they, they knew good and evil. It's, it's not that they merely, it was really the, the knowledge of it. They, they had experiential knowledge of it, just like intimacy with your wife, for example. Um, uh, and so when you, when they sinned it, that they became married to the law. In, in fact, Romans calls this out where, uh, uh Paul says that, uh, that you died to the law so that you could be married to another. Our flesh is married to the law and the law is the ultimate um, spousal abuser. Um, it's the ultimate tyrant. We're married to that tyrant, a, 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 an unruly uh, evil husband, essentially that, that demands uh, that demands that, that we, uh, that we do what it says, says it uh, tells us to do. And so that's why we need to be married to another. And that is Christ who is the spirit. He was the spirit. So we need to be married to the spirit uh, who is Christ is a pic who is a picture of the tree of life. Um, and so in Adam, everyone was because Adam sinned, everything that was begat after him was corrupt. In fact, God, it's not just that we're condemned by our own personal sins. We're uh, the Bible actually says that we're a, a, under a threefold uh, sentence of sin. We're sinners by nature because of our, 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 our headship in Adam, because, because we were essentially in Adam when he sinned. So all the things that, all the sins that were uh, imputed to Adam were imputed to us. Uh, and the, we are set under the sentence of, of, because of our federal headship in Adam, because of our personal acts of sin. And then also uh, Bible says we're all, it's a sentence that we're all in unbelief. I think we all start as unbelievers. Um, and so we're condemned uh, in three ways. And that's all because we were born in Adam, but 
That's why we need to be born again in Christ, because just as in Christ, we all became sinners. Even before we even sinned, we were God saw us as sinners. Um, and that's why we need to be born again in Christ so that Christ basically filled our spot in that rotten family tree, which genetic family tree, essentially, that's Adam. He filled that our, our place in it. And now we can be born again in his new perfect tree. So just as Adam, Adam sinned once and all the sin was imputed to us. Now, uh, again, before we even committed any sin, we were considered sinners. And with in Christ, we are, if you believe, uh, uh, a single act of faith, a momentary act of faith, the moment you believe that Christ died for all your sins and uh, he was the son of God and rose again to give us eternal life, that gift is yours. It's forever yours. You're born again into his, his family's tree. And all the righteous things that Christ did uh, are counted to you. So people say things like, well, what about water baptism? Well, the Bible says the it, only by the shedding of blood is are, are, is the forgiving, forgiveness of sins, not works. Not water baptism, nothing. In fact, when some people ask, well, water baptism, we must be water baptized. Well, guess what? When, when uh, John the Baptist came to uh, baptize Jesus, or when Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized, Christ said, um, uh, John was worrying, well, why should I baptize you? He said, so that all righteousness must be fulfilled. So that all righteousness would, would be fulfilled. So Christ is truly our, in he is our substitute. God sees his perfect life and credits to your account. It, 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 so if 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 if, Christ, if baptism was required, then there was no reason for Christ to be baptized. There's verses that say if you add to God's word or subtract to God's word, you your your uh, name will be taken out of the book of life. Well, again, that's for an unbeliever because Christ never spoke, uh, added, or subtracted from God's word. So anything that people would uh, try to uh, make you look to yourself like you must do this. I, I guarantee you there'll be a verse in the Bible that says that Christ fulfilled that in Christ is your perfect substitute. And as our perfect substitute, if you believe in him, you're born again into his perfect family tree and you died. You died with in Christ. Your your history and the fallen Adamic race has ceased. So in the same way, for on, the only way for me to stop being a white, uh, nasally voiced, uh, 47 year old male is to die. Um if I, once I die, I'm no, no longer any of those things. In the same way, the only way I can stop being a sinner, considered a sinner, is to die. And we die to the law that condemns sin. Where there's no law, there's no sin. And that's why uh, Paul makes it uh, over, clear over and over again that we die to the law. There's zero law. that can, There's nothing. The law defines what's righteous. It defines what's unrighteous, and it defines what's righteous. And if there's no law, there's nothing that can be held against you. Where there's no law, there is no sin. And even, and I think that's drawn out in Adam and Eve, where uh, there was only one law. They couldn't eat from the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. Yet, technically, if you want to think about it, again, it's, I think it's important to realize that Adam and Eve were not righteous. If they were righteous, they would never have sinned, but they were innocent. And yet they desired the, the, the wisdom for the tree. They the desired for the knowledge of good and evil to be like God's, as if God was holding back uh, something from them. So in, in that, in, in, a, in a purely technical sense, in a righteousness sense, um, they were not guilty under the law because there, there was no law against desiring. But even now, if we have such desires, uh, it shows that we, it just only shows that we're unrighteous. The law only exposes unrighteousness. It, it demands righteousness, but it can't provide it. Only through faith in Christ, our perfect substitute, will we can we be reckoned to God. And once we're once we believe that, the nanosecond you believe it, you have eternal life, and it's never nothing. You know, the whole world's going to try to get you to disbelieve it. It's a struggle, and that's why. Ball calls it the. Uh, it's a race. It's a race that we. Uh, and a race it definitely involves effort and works, and it, it has nothing to do with our eternal salvation. But it's it's a race from once you believe to uh, continue to believe, which is admonished throughout Scripture. You don't you wouldn't admonish an unbeliever to continue to believe, uh, and also uh, to 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 uh, sow to the new birth, which is we can gain rewards by allowing the Holy Spirit to yielding to the Holy Spirit's will in our life and uh, pursuing things of the spirit as opposed to things of the flesh. Um, so I hope that was clear to everyone. If you have any questions, you can always email the church of, or sorry, church of the eternally secure at gmail.com. All right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that gospel message. Uh, Sister Renee, uh, let me hear your summary and then uh, a, some exhortation, please. All right. 
Well, I want to address something I said. I just saw here, Mike was asking, a little bit tired of living religion's rules or whatever. There's a, that's a strange mentality. For one, sin isn't freedom. Our attitude with the Lord isn't, how much can I sin and not have consequence for it? How much can I sin and get away with it? That's not our mentality. Our mentality is, praise God, he saved us. And now, on a day-to-day -day basis, I want to know him more. And I don't focus on me and my sin and living right. Oh, I got to wake up today and I'm not allowed to lie or drink. Or We don't think that way. It's, I'm saved. I have eternal life. I'm going to live my life and do everything to glorify God. And if something doesn't glorify him or gives him a bad name, I don't want to do it. I, it doesn't mean I'm perfect. But that's not religion, honey. That's just realizing God's love for you and wanting to love him back. We all fail, but you gotta get rid of this mentality that sin is somehow freedom, because it's not, it's bondage. Matter of fact, everything in scripture talks about how sin ties you up and binds you. If you've ever seen an alcoholic, you know how it destroys people. All right, so with that being said, uh, there were some really good questions. Very Sometimes it takes a little bit to read them, you know, to understand exactly what's being asked. But it's amazing to me some of the things uh, people come up with. Like I, I hadn't even thought some of these questions before. Um, but today uh, I thought I would just reinforce the truth that God wants you saved. Everybody's wondering about losing salvation like god's waiting for you to mess up so he can throw you into hell remember that when we studied brother luke jonathan edwards just hanging you over hell by a string waiting for you to screw up so he could just cut the cord and no god wants you saved he wanted it so much that he left heaven became a man died on the cross lived the perfect life and died on the cross and was buried and rose again that's how much he wants you saved. And yes, Jesus is God who pre-existed in heaven with the Father. So he did leave heaven. He said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. So I found a verse here to show you God wants you saved. He wants everyone saved, regardless of what that wicked John Calvin says. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. It's God's will that you be saved and come into the, what's the knowledge of the truth? What Christ accomplished for you on Calvary gave you eternal life. Now, if you really believe that, you should, with the Holy Spirit in you, want to show him you love him back. There's no conditions on salvation here, but that's God's heart for you. He wants all people saved. And he's done everything he can. It's it's up to you whether you believe him or not. But he wants you to know the truth. That's why all of us here are preaching it. That's why all of us here stand for the truth of that gospel message. It's the greatest news ever. And if I could do the happy dance with Luke, I'd do it right now. Woohoo! Woohoo! Yeah! Woohoo! Yeah! There you go. Thank you, Jesus. All yeah. right. <laughs> All right, uh, Brother Daniel, give us your uh, closing remarks, and, and uh, uh, we'd like another song if if it's you can. Sure, absolutely. Always, uh, always good to be here. Enjoyed the questions. Uh, one of the reasons why I just wanted to say this: one of the reasons why um, I try to stress the believing the gospel clearly and concisely and full assurance fully persuaded is because the bible says many shall say unto me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in thy name 
and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And he said, Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And I used to live in that state of wondering if I believed right and, and all of that kind of thing. It's my home that cannot change no matter how I live or anything. And I just want people to come to that same understanding. And because I was a lost religious man who knew the gospel, preached the gospel, quoted the verses, um, tried to convince myself that I believed, that's, I pretty much spent my whole life trying to do that. The Lord showed me that's not what believing is. I had to be persuaded by the scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so that's why we keep giving the scriptures. We want people to know. Um, we want people to have that assurance. And that assurance only comes from God, not by some other man trying to convince you you're okay. Not you trying to convince yourself that you believe. But when you actually believe, you know it. it you know, it's like I, I don't ever question if I'm a man or not. I don't have to keep on believing every day. Oh, I, I got to believe today that I'm a man. It's just automatic because I, I already know it. It's the same thing with salvation. I know I'm a child of God. I don't have to just keep on believing. I just believe it because it's the truth. Um, I like that verse you, you shared, Renee. Another one I thought of was 1 Timothy 4. 10, he's the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So even God's got one up on even um, the world by saying he's actually, he is the savior of all men. They have a savior. They just don't believe it. Everything that has been accomplished for salvation was done 2000 years ago. Everybody's been purged. Everybody's sanctified. Everybody's been perfected. If they don't believe it, it's not imputed unto them. And I love talking about it. And I just want people to know the same thing I know. Don't believe me. Don't trust me. Look at the word of God. The word of God talks about that confidence, being fully persuaded, full assurance. Don't settle for anything less than knowing. And when you know, when you know him, I mean, it's just a, it's just a wonderful thing to know that when you, if you didn't wake up this, the next morning, or if you got in a car wreck at any time, or if, you know, with all the health issues I got, you know, my kidneys could shut down. If, if that time comes, I'll be with the Lord. Not because I've done anything. Not because, oh, I just believed. <laughs> I, I use, my pastor uses this example of if a man falls off a, a cruise ship, He's flailing, flailing around there in the water. Somebody throws him a life preserver and then they pull him in and they ask him, well, what saved you? He said, my arm. Because I grabbed a hold of the life preserver. <laughs> it was the life preserver that saved. You're flopping out there with two arms. That's what people think when they try to think about their own faith. Oh, I've got to. They're putting the focus on themselves. The Bible says looking unto Jesus. Jesus is our salvation. He's the person of salvation. So I wanted to sing about him on that, on that note real quick. And I think y'all will enjoy this song. All right, here we go. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture now burst on my side 
angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day perfect submission all is at rest i and my savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long god bless you guys Mm, awesome thank you brother that was wonderful. awesome well, wonderful that i don't have to wake up and believe i'm a man today <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think the song and my comment on it will be the right ending for the program and this this blessed assurance uh i believe that is the gospel uh the gospel is the good news that eternal life is assured to us it's guaranteed and if a person doesn't have that assurance, uh, doesn't have that guarantee, that confidence, uh, then you don't believe the gospel. And, and uh, so that's something that if that's the case for you, then we better start from scratch. And, uh, but uh, uh, the talk today, uh, we got a few, a few frequent questions, um, but um, let me see. I don't remember every question now, but uh, I guess that's it. I don't really have anything else to add. So uh, this is Sunday. Um, let me see. Don't forget to join us uh, Wednesday at the same channel. It's uh, 9.30 Eastern time uh, for the Wednesday night Bible study. I think we're, we're in uh, Galatians chapter 5 now. So join us then. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. Bless you all in the name. Oh, wait a second. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.